Great evening, everyone. It's great to see you again. I am Reverend Dr. Karen Owens. I am adjunct faculty and director of strategic research at Hood Theological Seminary. Welcome, welcome to session three of Critical Race Theory and the Church, Unpacking Race and Racism in Religious Spaces. Tonight's focus is on race and personal identity, facilitated by Hood Theological Seminary alum, Reverend Dr. Samuel Oliver Jr. And this free course offering is presented via the Pathways for Tomorrow initiative of the Lilly Endowment Incorporated. Now, before we begin, just a few reminders remain grateful for this tremendous turnout on this very important subject. Therefore, we're going to ask again if you would please keep your devices muted throughout the session. And as with session two, the PowerPoint presentation slides and recording will be sent to you prior to session four, which begins in two weeks. And also, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat so that Dr. Oliver can address them either tonight or in writing, which will also be sent to your email addresses. And certainly I'd like to thank our president, Virgil Lattimore, Mr. John Everett, Ms. Kelly Bryant, and Ms. Sandra Oliver for their valued assistance and support. I'm sure you can imagine there's a lot of work that occurs in the background to ensure success of our programs. And so now I will turn it over to Dr. Oliver. Thank you again for joining us and welcome. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, as Dr. Owen said, we are in session three of this seminar, which means that we are at the halfway point. So thank you all for sticking with me and for your continued support of this, this very important topic. We really appreciate your feedback. Uh, we've gotten some great questions and comments that have been added to the actual chat. And so I appreciate those because it pushes me and it causes me to think. And ultimately that's what this whole seminar is about, right? It's about creating a space where we can talk about one of our most uh, crucial topics in a space where we can feel as though we can express ourselves uh, in a manner that is safe and free from judgment. And as Dr. Owens alluded to or mentioned earlier, we are gonna ask you just to adhere to some basic seminar etiquette throughout. And if, if you've been with me for the last two weeks, you've heard this before. Um, if not, I will just repeat it again for everyone's sake. Um, First of all, we recognize that this is a very sensitive topic. Racism is something that we just don't intuitively do in this country. And as we've talked about in previous session, if we do talk about it, we tend to talk about it amongst people who usually share our views, right? Um, so we recognize that this is a sensitive topic. And as such, we ask that you just be respectful of other people's opinions as people express them in the chat room, because the chat is our primary means for dialogue um, in the Zoom session, right? So as you observe someone putting something in the chat, if it doesn't align with your views, so long as it's not offensive, please respect that. That being said, um, <clears throat> we do reserve the right if someone is being abusive or just being outright offensive in chat, we have the ability to remove you from this session. Uh, we don't wanna have to do that. So we just ask that you just be mindful of other people's opinions and that you keep your comments professional and respectful. Um, that being said, please share your comments and questions in the chat. Um, it, please put, put your comments, your questions in there. I try and, and scroll through them throughout the class. I don't always get a chance to, um, but I certainly get them after the fact. So if you send your questions to Dr. Owens and her email address is right there on the screen, she will get them to me and I try and address questions. I may not always respond to comments, but if I get questions, I do try and respond to the questions before the start of the next seminar. 
So please, if you have them, put them in the actual chat or email them uh, to Dr. Owens uh, at her email address as presented there on the screen. Okay, that being said, we got the administrative stuff out of the way. We're going to dive right into this week's session. And this is a six week didactic as we talked about uh, from the beginning and we're in week three. And as Dr. Owen said, tonight's focus is on race and personal identity. Race and personal identity <clears throat> is our focus for tonight. But let me just borrow just a couple of seconds and add my thanks to the Lilly Endowment and Hood Theological Seminary for allowing me this opportunity to, to have this uh, uh, opportunity just to dialogue with people from across the country, across the nation. And so I'm thankful. So we have people in our who have registered from all denominations and from every corner of the United States. So I'm appreciative of your interest and your support. Um, but this is the outline for the remainder of the, the, the sessions that we have coming, coming up. We will culminate on week six, which is November 20th, um, looking at the role of the church in social justice. And then next week, as we see here, we'll talk about racism and, <clears throat> and, and theology. Week five will be building a multicultural church community. And as I said, we'll close out with the role of the church in social justice. But tonight... Um, we're going to focus on race and personal identity. And I know that not everybody who is logged on tonight has been with us from week one. <clears throat> and so what I like to do each week is very quickly, um, because this seminar is rooted in looking at racism in the church with a particular emphasis on critical race theory, I, I find it I think it's useful each week for me to give you a quick recap, because if you're logging on for the first time tonight, you might not know what critical race theory is, what are the basic fundamental precepts associated with this term. Um, it's a very hot button term. Uh, a lot of people throw out CRT and critical race theory and they gravitate to one aspect of it usually the aspect that suits their need or their, their particular interest. But for the sake of clarity, I just want to tell you the five fundamental precepts of critical race theory, which is the underpinning for everything that we're talking about in this class. And so first is this idea that racism is not the exception, but it is the rule in America. And this by itself, uh, challenges this idea that racism is something that is isolated or it is a by an exception. Um, no, CRT challenges that and says that it's embedded um, deeply into our structures, our institutions, particularly our laws and our practices. So it challenges that. The other thing this precept does is it removes racism from an individual dynamic and make it into something that is structural and systematic because rules, policies, and laws extend to societies, not just to individuals. So racism is not an exception, but the rule in American society is one of the tenets of CRT. The second one that I want to cover real briefly is this idea that the dominant majority typically does not make con concessions to those who are not in the, in, the, in the majority unless it benefits them. And we sometimes hear this referred to as interest conversion. <clears throat> interest conversion uh, addresses this dynamic that says, hey, the people who are in a majority are really in it to maintain the status quo because the power dynamics typically tend to favor them. So there's usually not a overriding interest for them to change or to make concessions to people who are not in the majority, unless it's something that also happens to benefit them. That's called interest conversion, right? 
And then the third principle is this idea that race is a product of a social construct, meaning that it is not a biological characteristic. There's nothing biological that says that you are supposed to be conveyed as black or white. Uh, it is a man-made construct. Therefore, it is not objective. Um, it is something that has been created in our societal structures, usually for political and social reasons. And we know that it's been used throughout history, particularly in this country, to support discrimination, right? <clears throat> so race is a product of a social construct. The next precept is this idea that you can have multiple categories of oppression. And this is called intersectionality. And this refers to the overlapping of social, social characteristics such as race, gender, uh, class, um, <clears throat> uh, meaning that to fully grasp and understand racism, sometimes you have to look at it from a multifaceted perspective. So an individual, for example, could be oppressed or discriminated against from multiple perspectives. You could be black and be a female, um, which means that you have two different oppressions or types of characterizations of oppression that could impact you. So that is called intersectionality. And we're gonna talk about that later on tonight, again, as we start talking about how this plays into personal identity. And then the last precepts of CRT is this idea of counter storytelling, which supposes or promotes the idea that it's a method used to challenge the narrative that is usually put forth by the dominant or the majority culture that's in power. It is a way to amplify the voice of those who are not in power. And so one of their precepts is particularly when we talk about racism in America is that people of color have more insight about this oppression. And it's a way for us to hear and to tell the story from the perspective of those who are not in power. So those are the five fundamental principles that undergird critical race theory. <clears throat> And like I said, I, I find it useful, I think, to mention them each week because it does underpin most of everything that we're going to talk about. So tonight's topic, as we talked about, is this idea of race and personal identity. One of the things we have to understand when we talk about personal identity is this whole concept of how do we make sense of our perceptions and our experiences as we go through life? And all of us, all of us, I would argue, do it through the lens of our particular context, right? And there is neither a objective or universal lens that says everybody sees things this way or that way. Uh, there are all kinds of things that make up or influence how we uh, uh, how do we we personalize the whole concept of race and how do we even view ourselves as what makes us who we are, which is part of our personal identity. Now <clears throat> uh, in the book White Fragility, Robin D'Angelo, she throws out this idea that when we talk about personal identity, she says there's really two dynamics that we really have to go after, right? There is this idea that our personal identity is based upon our individualism, meaning that, you know, it who we are and how we see ourselves is really the fulfillment of our personal actions and the things that we do in life, right? We are unique and we stand apart from others based upon who we are, what we do, and all of the efforts that we pour into life. There is this concept that <clears throat> uh, we define, in other words, who we are. 
Now, when it comes to CRT, I will tell you people who, who ascribe to this concept as it relates to their personal identity, it, it makes it hard for them to then uh, digest and to comprehend concepts such as systemic racism, right? Because systemic racism says that there are things in society that transcends the individual meaning that you know racism can exist at an individual level but really when you look at CRT it really addresses it from the perspective of what are the 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 norms in society that needs to be addressed what are the systemic things the institutional pieces so when you overlay that with this concept of well my personal identity only comes from my uniqueness it presents a clash then there's this other concept that she brings out of objectivity, which is kind of promoting this idea that, you know, you can really be neutral and not be influenced by society or your context. And I challenge that. I mean, are any of us really neutral? I mean, the reality is we know that we are all we are all influenced and our personal identity comes from the makeup of a lot of things, right? Um, so the bottom line with this is that if we're gonna have a meaningful dialogue about race and racism and personal identity, we have to challenge some of these ingrained thoughts that people have about how we view ourselves when it comes to personal identity. So I thought before we go any further, we should probably talk a little bit in a class that's talking about racism and what is race? We've touched upon it, upon it in, the, in the previous sessions, but we haven't really gone into any in-depth discussions about race as a concept. And I think we need to kind of tease this out a little bit as we get into this dialogue about personal identity. And so the first thing that I want to point out is that we've talked about it a little bit when we define the five precepts of CRT. And that is that race is a social construct. It's not a biological characteristic. It is a means by which a society or people get together to characterize people. And you do this based upon characteristics such as skin color, people's facial features, uh, their hair texture, you name it. We have all of these things that we kind of throw into this bucket as a society to help us to identify people as a race. Keep in mind, none of these characteristics have any part in contributing to our inherent value as a person. Um, None of it determines our value or who we are in life. This is a social construct that has been man-made. And oh, by the way, it morphs over time. Um, so it has, it has changed over time to, feed, to, to meet the needs of a society as it, as it moves forward. Um, these, categorically, these categories we know have historically been used to create these hierarchies that allow people to discriminate against other people. And really, when you get right down to it, they've been used in a lot of ways to underpin power structure within society. And it's also a way in which some society use to allocate resources. So it is a structure that is underpinning a lot of the things that we know we've encountered in our, in our country as it relates to discrimination, uh, power, resource allocation. And as I've said over and over again, um, <clears throat> it's not a biological uh, structure that says we should have race. Um, and these things are perpetuated over time. Um, and they're impacted by a number of our societal influences. We know that how we perceive race is, is influenced by, you know, the media. We know it's influenced by our history, by stereotypes. All of these things play into how we 
construct and come up with what we call our personal identity. So race is an integral part of uh, our personal identity. So let's talk then about this idea of personal identity. Personal identity is a very multifaceted concept and there are multiple variables that help to formulate an individual's sense of who you are. Because that's really what we're talking about, right? When we talk about personal identity, we're talking about those unique set of characteristics, qualities, beliefs that define an individual and distinguish us from one another. So how you view yourself and also how other people view you uh, all play into this concept of personal identity. There is not a monolithic concept that, or a, a precept that says, uh, for example, that a Black person has to adhere to this set of characteristics or vice versa, that a white person has to you know, conform to this set of characteristics. There are multiple things that play into what formulates our thought and how people see us from a personal identity perspective. They include our cultural identity, our gender, we've talked about it. Yes, racial identity is a big part of it. And I'm gonna throw in your religious identity can also influence how people see you and also how you see yourself. <clears throat> Certainly those of us who call ourselves believers or Christians, have to include our religious identity as part of who we are. If we're influenced by the word of God, then that has an impact on how we identify ourselves, right? So race and personal identity uh, play a crucial role in defining who we are. So I'm gonna pause just for a second. So in week one, I ask you guys to put in the chat, I ask the question, why is it so hard for us to talk about racism? And you guys gave me some great responses in the chat. You had some great responses. It occurred to me that we've been going at it now and we're in week three, as I said, and I've not gotten this question. Um, <clears throat> Well, I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold it. I have a question that I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to bring up later on um, because is. Now, I'm going to ask it here. I'm going to go back. I want you to go into the chat. And I want you to tell me what is racism, because we haven't really defined it over the course of three weeks. We've been talking about it. And I think we all come at it from a perspective and we all have, I think, in our mind, a definition of racism. But I want you to put in your own words in chat, how do you define racism? What is racism to you? Or how do you think, how would you define racism if an alien showed up tomorrow and stopped you on the street, wherever you are, and says, hey, Help me understand this thing going on in America called racism. How would you describe it to an alien? How would you describe it? I don't need a book. I don't need five paragraphs. I just want you very simply give me a couple of sentences on how you define racism. All right. And then we're going to talk about it in the context of this seminar and how critical race theory plays into it, okay? Negatively judging people, a negative classification for African. All right, I see them coming in now. Good, good. Racism is a failure to see value. I see that, okay, good, I like those. <clears throat> value grouping over another people by giving privilege and advantages, love it. Keep them coming, keep them coming. I want to hear your thoughts. Because I believe when it's all said and done, we're probably going to touch on a lot of what you guys are putting in the chat. Okay, keep them coming. All right, I'm going to jump out of chat so that I can continue on because I do need to stop at a certain time tonight. But let's talk about racism. 
And I want to walk my way through this because there are terms and I think elements of racism <clears throat> that we sometimes commingle, right? And they all play a part in it. So don't get me wrong, right? So prejudice is certainly an element that comes into play when we talk about racism. Prejudice is just prejudgment based upon little informed information or no experience um, on that particular group um, or person. You're just making, you're projecting onto everyone from that group your biasness, if you will. And as I've talked about before, prejudice tend to be shared among certain groups, meaning that you find us to be very much a group dynamic because we, we, we have shared belief in the lanes we swim in, as I like to say, meaning a lot of this is culturally based. Some of this is based upon family history, where you are, where you grow, where you grew up. All of those dynamics can help inform how you develop your prejudice over time. All of us have prejudice. OK, all of us, we all make preconceived judgments about people, whether we want to admit it or not. <clears throat> I don't care who you are. I don't care what race. We all make value judgments or we make we make assumptions about people, I should say, based upon what we see. And this is something that most of us have been conditioned over time. That's just prejudice. Discrimination is when you act based upon prejudice. This is when you start to see people taking action based upon these preconceived notions about somebody else. And they can play themselves out in a number of ways. You ignore somebody because you think something in some way about them or you avoid them because you think this way about this person. And over time, we can actually develop hatred is one of the emotions that can grow out of being prejudiced. <clears throat> now, like I said before, all of us can acknowledge that we have some sense of unease around certain groups of people, whether you're black or white. We all have these intrinsic things that have been instilled in us, like I said, through history, through association, um, that help us to, to, to develop these prejudices. So when you start to put prejudice into action, and to act differently, solely based upon that, we then transition into discrimination. So discrimination comes from prejudice, okay? So now let's talk about racism as a construct, and particularly as it relates to critical race theory, and we're gonna see how this is woven into this whole idea of personal identity. First, you have to understand that racism in this construct, particularly for CRT, is not an actual event, especially on the personal level. Racism is a structure. So when one racial group's collective prejudice is then underpinned by power, or if they have the illegal authority, they have the institutional uh, uh, leadership in order to control how things are being done. This is when societal actions are actually transformed into racism. So racism occurs when a racial group's prejudice is backed by both legal authority and institutional control. In the context of what we're talking about, I want you to please keep this in mind when we talk about racism in the context of CRT, it transcends the individual acts of prejudice and discrimination. <clears throat> you can still encounter racism at the individual level through discrimination and prejudice, but what we're talking about is the system of racism that is being carried out in institutions through policies, through laws, um, through institutions primarily, right? So, and then there's this thought that I want you to also understand that racism always starts with an ideology, right? So <clears throat> when we talk about an ideology, we're really talking about our belief system. And so 
we know that these ideologies, they, they, they actually provide a framework where we get a lot of our big ideas that then get reinforced through society, through laws or practices, and then they become institutionalized over time, right? These ideologies, we know they can feed into things like implicit biasness or, or microaggression forms of racism. But they always start <clears throat> with this belief um, and in the sense of racism, it starts with this belief that one race is superior to another. And it underpins then structural ways of discriminating people. So people of color can also have prejudice and discriminate against white people. But CRT would argue that, and this one really hits a lot of people the wrong way because CRT would argue that generally black people as a, as a whole, as a whole, lack the social and institutional power to actually discriminate against white people in America. Now that one, if you let that sink in for a while, uh, like I said, some people, it rubs them the wrong way. But I think when you take it out of the realm of individualism and speak to it from the perspective of institutionalism and systematic racism, I think you kind of get where they're coming from, whether you agree with that or not. But uh, that's the, the context in which I wanted to lay out this definition of racism. Now, critical race theory always looks at the outcome as a measure of races, right? So you can pass laws, you can have policies in place that say that certain things are illegal. What really birthed the critical race theory movement was when they went back and looked at the civil rights era and the laws that were passed, and they asked the questions of, well, were we any better off? And could we measure and see where blacks were even any better as a result of laws being passed, their conclusion was there wasn't. And so they then came up with this whole idea of, well, there's got to be a different way to measure racism. And it really spawned the whole critical race theory movement. They always look at outcomes as a measure of racism. So <clears throat> as we talk about race and personal identity, as I said earlier, this is really getting at <clears throat> the process through which society collectively creates, categorizes, and how we put understanding around people. And this, you have to understand, is when a society gets together and they collectively decide that we're going to place value around certain things, it helps to form and shape people's personal identity. <clears throat> they're not inherent, they're not natural, like we've talked about. So a society, a group of people have to consciously decide that this is the way in which we're going to apply value. This is how we're going to characterize people through social interactions, through institutions, cultural practices, et cetera. And so there's always this element of comparison as a part of the social construct of race. And an example, again, I, I got this from Robin D'Angelo. I thought she made a good point. She says, you know, we, we, we don't have any idea of what pretty actually means unless we have some concept of something that is ugly, meaning that somebody has to put some value against something that says that something is deemed pretty and something on the other end of the spectrum is deemed ugly. The same holds true with race. So what we now know as black has no meaning in concept unless somebody, a society got together and says, okay, there's black and there's white 
And we now know over time that has morphed into other racial characters, characterization. But the bottom line in all of this is that this is all a social construct that plays into how we identify ourselves and how people value us as people. <laughs> so the question becomes, how do you how do you view yourself in light of these kinds of social characterization? How do you view yourself? How do you append self-value? How do you actually allow the social construct to influence who you are? Do you believe these social constructs influence who you are? I'm gonna throw that out there as a question. Do you believe how society defines people and how they have put together this construct of race, does it impact your personal identity? I'm gonna ask you to throw some thoughts in the chat on that one as well. Do you think the way societies have defined people have a, an impact on your self-perception, your personal identity, on who you say you are? Throw some, some comments at me. I want to hear your thoughts on this. I'm gonna scroll through the chat just a little bit just to see what what what, what I'm what I'm what kind of feedback we're getting I'm getting here. Because again, we're trying to develop this idea that race plays a part in our personal identity, personal identity plays a part in how we value ourselves. And it also plays a part on how other people look at you. And so the whole idea of this class is to unearth some of these underlying topics that play into racism so that we can address them in a, in a, in a very meaningful way, right? <clears throat> if we don't talk about them, we will never address them. If we don't talk about them, we don't address them. So we see the social construct carried out in many facets of society. We see it in the legal system. We know the history of our country uh, characterized African-American as less and whole. Um, we see it in the discrimination as we talked about last week and the week before, I believe, in how our education system emerged in this country, where we had separate school systems for blacks and white. <clears throat> we see this characterized in media and how certain races are portrayed, right? We see stereotypes that reinforces negative ideas or conversely, if they want to promote a certain uh, uh, idea, they can play that up as well. But we see this played out in multiple facets of society. And I want to hear your thoughts on how do you see that uh, playing into your actual concept of personal identity? Okay. Um. You can internalize that in a number of ways. I see that comment in there. It takes time to build trust. Yes, absolutely. Colorism is an issue. Yep. Certainly our culture, what we've been taught, our history, um, all of those play into it. So great, great inserts there. So my point with all of that is race plays into self-perception and self-esteem. And personal identity can have either a, a positive impact or certainly it can impact you negative, right? Depending on how you process this racial identity, it can contribute to a, a, sensey, a healthy sense of self-esteem and self-worth. There are certainly people um, we know, for example, in the 70s coming out of the civil rights era, 
there was a strong black power movement where black people embraced their ethnic background. You know, I remember my older brother going out and buying a darshiki. I had no idea what that was at the time. But we had this movement in the 70s, for example, where people were very much embracing their racial identity and they viewed it as a positive. And so um, <clears throat> it can have a positive impact on your identity, I guess is what I'm saying. Conversely, we know that this, the opposite can be true, right? Because of experiences of discrimination or negative stereotypes, you can internal you can have, lead to what's called internalized racism, which means that <clears throat> your self worth is called into doubt because you have, for lack of a better term, you have internalized all of the negativism that comes along with racism, and you start to believe that a lot of the stereotypes, a lot of the the way we are portrayed in society, you internalize them and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy almost for some people. And they believe, well, society has deemed that, you know, I am such and such. So there's no hope almost, right? So this results in lower self-esteem and not, not fully being feeling as though you belong. So that's the flip side of how this whole idea of personal identity, which is influenced by racism, can impact us on an individual level. We can <clears throat> internalize this in a number of ways. We can let it be a positive thing. We can let it be a negative thing. And I threw this on here just for the sake of dialogue. I threw code switching in there because this has become a thing. And I hear, I know in my circle, uh, I hear people talking about code switching all the time. And code switching oops, is this idea that when we are uh, in one setting, and this I'm speaking from the perspective of African-American, it can apply to, to multiple racial and, and cultural settings or backgrounds. But I know I have friends who says, well, when I'm in a certain setting, I adjust my language, I adjust my behavior, how I communicate, <clears throat> because I don't want to be judged or I don't want to be stereotyped in a certain way. But then when I'm amongst my friends, I switch back, right? And 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 I do the bro language. I do, you know, I dap up my brothers. But if I'm in a board meeting and I see him, I'm going to shake his hand. I'm not going to dap him up, right? I'm going to adjust how I actually conduct myself. And I contend this is all a part of us trying to contextualize and trying to come to grips, come to grips with race and personal identity. It's one of those things that we might not think about in so many ways, but when you think about it in the larger context, code switching, I contend, is part of how we try to, to, to digest this whole idea. And I'd be interesting to know if I'm the only one who's ever experienced code switching. So throw that in the, in the chat, if you will, also. If you've ever heard someone, know someone, seen someone uh, execute code switching, I want you to go to work tomorrow and start staring at your coworkers and start, you know, documenting every little thing they do. That's not the intent. I'm just throwing that out there to say that it is. I think a modern way of trying to contextualize race and personal identity. So these things play together is my whole point that I'm trying to, to drive out. <clears throat> so because of time and because I wanted to make sure I also when we talk about personal identity, we've talked a lot about the societal aspect of how it influences racism and how it plays into uh, our personal identity. And I mentioned in one of the earlier slides that certainly religion plays a part in that as well. And so 
And the five minutes I have left tonight, excuse me, I'm going to get a little bit of water. Forgive me. I want to briefly bring religion into this dialogue a little bit. But I think as we've seen tonight, <clears throat> this whole idea of race and personal identity has to account for the religious context, the interplay between cultural and religious expectations, I do believe play a part in an individual's identity. And I think this is especially true for African-Americans given our history in this country and the role that the black church has played. Um, if you believe some of the current day data, uh, some would argue that the role of the church in religion as it relates to our personal identity is actually waning. I think churches as a whole, as a group are seeing a decline um, if you believe the data in influence, um, church attendance across the board has been going down for decades. Um, when you look at this dynamic from a demographic, uh, it certainly seems to be pay, playing out more so with the younger generations, the, the millennials and the generation X. Um, anyhow, <clears throat> but I would argue on the whole, I think we as a society or Black or African-Americans have to na navigate this complexity because religion plays a part in who we are, how we identify ourselves. And again, like I say, this is certainly, certainly true, regardless of your race, if you are a believer. You have to say that you have this intersection of racial, cultural, and religious identities um, and they don't always align, I guess is the point that I'm trying to, to make here, right? For example, the one that I just wanted to bring out, because it comes up a lot in theological circles, in religious circles, is this idea. Many African Americans tend to either relate, not all, I don't want to characterize all African Americans as being supporters or believers in liberation theology. But given our history, I think you can certainly understand why it had a foothold in the African American community. And this sometimes put us at odd with American society writ large uh, because liberation theology did not have its genesis in the rest of the Protestant religion, which we know in America stems from the Roman Catholic Church, um, was actually expanded during the Great Awakening to really account for this burgeoning country we call America now. But <clears throat> liberation theology came afterwards, and it contextualized Christianity in a way to address a lot of the oppression, the suffering that African-Americans had encountered in this country. And so that's another element of our personal identity that some of us still grapple with. The way in which we conduct ourselves on Sunday mornings is, in some aspects, is very different. We're many African-American churches, especially depending on denominations, can be very expressive in the way we we conduct ourselves, right? Um, this sometimes can also lead to so a conflict. But again, it is part of our personal identity <clears throat> and we have to navigate through all of these contextual things, through all of these aspects of life. So my whole idea tonight was to address critical race theory, and to weave in through the lens of how it plays out through racism and how it helps to define who we are. And I know I kind of sped through that tonight, but I promised Dr. Owens that I was going to leave a little bit of time near the back tonight because she wants to speak to you 
briefly about trying to get some feedback for this class. So <clears throat> that being said, please, please, if you have questions, throw them in the chat, email them to Dr. Owens. They will get to me. I will make an earnest effort to respond to all questions um, before our next session, which is coming up in two weeks. With that being said, I'm going to pause now. And I thank you again for your time and your attention tonight. And I look forward to the three remaining sessions that we have. But now I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Owens. Thank you so much, Dr. Oliver. And again, thank you all for being here. Before we close, we do have a brief survey that we would like for you to complete before you log off. It's just three or four quick questions. Once you complete the survey, then simply hit the su submit button. You have five minutes to do that. So we'll pause here if you would please um, complete the survey and it should show on your screen here in just a minute. It's in the chat. Okay, it's in the chat. Yes. The okay. link to the survey is actually in the chat. If you scroll all the way down near the end, you will see the link to the to the survey. Okay. And it's not a long survey, as Dr. Owens mentioned. So please, we value your feedback. So if you would, please. Please take five minutes and give us your feedback. Thank you. Excuse me, Dr. Owens. Yes. Um, are the uh, chat responses included in our um, the files that we get? I haven't looked at those yet. Like the the summaries that we get. No, they are not. But I can, since we had so many comments this time, I will share them. Thank you. You're welcome. It's been great. I completed my survey and I'm leaving. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Owens, the link is not opening for me. Thank you and good night. I've completed the survey. This is Doris Hicks. Okay, for those of you who have completed the survey, and if you're having difficulty, we will send it out in, in an email too. And if you're not able to fill it out tonight, you'll get it in your inbox. But we do really want to thank, I know people are finishing the survey and checking out. So we do really want to thank you for your attendance tonight, especially to Dr. Oliver. Again, please email any questions to me, Dr. Karen Owens. My email address is in the chat, kowens at hoodseminary.edu. And Dr. Oliver will address them all. And you will receive the documents, the reminder for session four and the Zoom link just prior to our next session, which occurs October the 23rd at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the topic is racism and theology. So again, we thank you for being with us tonight. We thank you for completing the survey and we look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. If you're still completing the survey, that's fine. Take your time. But for those who have finished until we meet again, blessings and shalom each of you and good night. Thank you. Good night. Great session. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.